I'm smelling coffee and birds are singing just outside. Here comes your mercy streaming in with the morning light. My heart is facing breaking up to your smile. Good morning. Welcome back to Breakfast with the Bible. Today's Thursday. Uh, we're covering Psalm 35, verses 1 to 8. I will go ahead and, like you, will read the whole thing, which is 28 verses. And then we'll go back and we'll just cover those, those first eight verses. And then tomorrow we'll do 9 to, I believe it's 16. And then the 17 to, it uh, looks like 21. And 22 to 28. So, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause they have hid me, hid for me their net in a pit, which thou, excuse me, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him that unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction, let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. And all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which de deliverest the poor from him? That is too strong for him, yea, the poor, and the needy from him that spoileth him. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for, evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I have myself, I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. But in mine adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. With hypocritical mockers in feasts, they gnash upon me with their teeth. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling, from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me, and say, Aha, aha, our eye hath seen it. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Keep not silence, O Lord, be not far from me. Stir up thyself, and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so would we have it. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his saints. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Oh. All right, so Psalm 35 is simply a psalm of David. So we're not really certain the circumstances, um, but it has been suggested that this is regarding Saul's pursuit of David. In uh, it's Psalm 1, uh, 1 Samuel, excuse me, uh, 24, 15, which is congruent with David's opening statement in verse 1, plead my cause. 
So David's enemies were commonly also the enemies of the Lord, in which case this prayer was valid and appropriate. Spurgeon wrote, Every saint of God shall have this privilege. The accuser of the brethren shall be met by the advocate of the saints. So what Spurgeon is saying is that every follower of Christ is going to come across this kind of opposition, this undeserved, unprovoked opposition. Verse 2, take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. It is a dramatic image to consider our Lord in armor, but David is pleading with God to fight a battle on his behalf. Take hold. He's telling God, take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. David is, is asking God to, to prepare for war. Isaiah 59, 17 and 18 says, For he, the Lord, put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as, his, as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands, he will repay uh, recompense. So David is requesting that, that God gets dressed for battle, gets dressed for war, because David needs somebody to defend him. Verse 3, draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. David's prayer includes both defense and offense. Draw out thy spear and stop. That's, and, and, and then, um, yeah, the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. So David is asking God to, to kind of handle everything. David finds protection behind the Lord's shield. This is, uh, I think in verse, okay, so verse 2, you've got shield and buckler. Verse 3, you've got spear. So David is making sure that his prayer is thorough. Spurgeon says, Brethren, there is nothing that can make you strong to labor for God, bold to fight against your enemies, and mighty to resist your temptations, like a full assurance that God is your God and your sure salvation. So again, Spurgeon is saying that you can't be strong enough apart from God. You can't work hard enough apart from God unless you are absolutely certain that he is God and he is your salvation. David was, in a sense, trying to encourage himself to remember his confidence in the Lord. If we look at verse 4, I noticed something, something in these verses 4, 5, and 6. Now, bear with me here. It, it may be something I've overlooked, Specifically, just 4, 5, and 6, because when we get to 7 and 8, it does kind of transition a little bit. But previous psalms were, had, had similar prayers, so may have, I may have also overlooked that before, but... Okay, I'll read them. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that divides my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind... And let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery. And let the angel of the Lord persecute them. So those three verses, if they stand alone, sound very different. Dishonor, shame, fear, confusion. Very often, these same things were brought to sinners. Brought, excuse me, brought sinners to their knees. These troubles have a way of humbling a person causing them to recognize their need for God and, and confidently assume that many of us felt those sometime before we called out to the Lord. So this, this dishonor, this confusion, this shame, this, this fear, if, if I remember correctly, a sense of one of those kind of causes you to reevaluate, causes you to look up if you will. So I don't see that, that this intent is stated, but I, I have to believe that David had a heart that would desire uh, this kind of thing before their, before their destruction. 
So what I, what I see that, that is, again, speculation, is that four, five, and six is, it would, it would be a request that those kinds of things would cause them to repent. I mean, those kinds of things cause many of us to repent. And I could only assume that, there's a fly, a moth in here. I can only assume that David would have a heart that would suggest that same kind of thing. But that being said, Spurgeon wrote, viewing sinners as men, we love them and seek their good. But regarding them as enemies of God, we cannot think of them with anything but detestation and a loyal desire for the confusion of their devices. No loyal subject can wish well to rebels. Squirmish sentimentality may object to the strong language here used, but in their hearts all good men wish confusion to mischief makers. Okay, so that being said, an enemy of God is is somebody we have trouble wishing well to. Now, New Testament requires us, commands us to wish well on our enemies, bless them, to curse you, and those, and those kinds of things. I have to believe that David also believed that kind of thing, but when you reach a certain point with your enemies and the enemies of God, you kind of see this this impasse that that may or may not be an option. You 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 could wish it, but you don't expect it. If we look at verse seven, for without cause, they have hid from me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Here, David gives validity to his request. They have they have no cause to treat me this way. And as believers, we will undoubtedly learn this to be true in our lives as well. We will be opposed simply because we've, we've, we've you know, proclaimed Christ or stand for the Lord. We will have enemies because we believe the word of God. Plain and simple. You can look outside right now and see that to be true. We will lose friends because we live a different way. First Peter 4.4, 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So... I don't, I don't hang out with those people anymore. Now they think I'm strange because I don't, I'm not interested in that kind of stuff. Um, you're going to have people against you. I mean, you know, you look around at, at the anger in this society, and it's, and it's almost humorous as to see the kind of things that cause people to be upset. You know, somebody will see a sign or hear something or, or whatever it may be, and they get belligerently angry over, over nothing. And there's, there's a battle going on. There is a spiritual battle going on. And when somebody sees something that represents truth, the rebellious... I'm going to use the word evil in, in somebody becomes infuriated because they oppose the truth. You know, the, the devil is a liar. He is the father of lies. He is everything that his, his whole point is deception. And he gets angry at the truth because he knows it. And so people get angry at something that, that speaks truth, that, that is, is, you know, is right because deep down they, they know that it's true and something inside of them doesn't want to agree with it. So they're not really angry at us. They're angry in themselves because there's a battle between this is true, but I don't want it to be. So it's, I mean, it, it's this clear indication of the spiritual battle, this clear indication that there is a bigger fight going on. It's not between this side and that side primarily. It's about up there and down there. It's those, it's the, it's the heaven against everything else kind of battle. And again, it's so obvious 
or it should be at least to, to believers, when they see the kind of hatred that stems from people who are opposed to the truth. Because it's almost like, I mean, the scripture says that everybody has been exposed and, and, and knows some level of truth because God has made it clear. So they are without excuse. So somehow there's this inner turmoil going on between what we know, what, what people know to be true and what people wish to be true. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a ploy from the enemy straight from the pits of hell. I mean, it's, and, and again, you can see it in their faces when, you know, they're, they're flipping you off or holding up a, a, a sign that, you know, has either a Bible verse or, or, or something that represents something good. And they don't even know why they're doing it. They're just, they're just honking at you, swearing at you, whatever it may be. And they, and they, if you were to ask them, they probably wouldn't even know. So that little rabbit trail ends here. So we're going to move, move on to verse 8. Let destruction come upon him at unawares or unexpectedly. And let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. So this kind of contradicts, if you will, my speculation for 4, 5, and 6. But I, I don't... I still don't think that David's heart would have been immediately for destruction. Um, but I, I think that David sees that he wants God to take care of it, whatever, whatever is necessary. Do whatever you see that's going to cause it to happen. Deal with it according to your purpose. And if it's destruction, so be it. Um, but... David really just wants the enemies of him and God to for their for their devices not to work for this destruction in verse 8 really for the destruction of the plans of the enemy for their purpose for their cause for their agenda and and we we too pray this prayer quite often uh, in today's society we're, we're praying for the destruction of the agenda of those who, who don't who don't seek truth, who don't seek uh, standard of God, and we're not we're not praying for anybody's demise. We're just praying for the destruction of the agenda or the plan. We're praying that that all these different things that are putting together just just fall apart, and and we ultimately have to trust that God's going to do what He sees fit, when He sees fit. So, Psalm 35, 1 to 8. Again, we'll, we'll start with uh, verse 9 tomorrow, and we'll go from there. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe, share, ring that bell. Um, check me out on Twitter. Not don't really do much, but it's really just there to kind of publish uh, or advertise a little bit more of the channel. And uh, we'll see you next time. God bless.